Good evening. I hope this video finds you doing well. I want to encourage you, if you can, to grab your Bible. If it's in the other room, you know, hit pause. I'll be frozen just uh, waiting for you to come back. So just hit pause and grab your Bible or your tablet or whatever, and I think it'll help to be able to walk through the scriptures together here uh, on this video. So uh, we're going to be looking at John chapter 11, which tells about the death and resurrection of Lazarus and the uh, ministry of Jesus to Lazarus and to his sisters, and by extension, the people that are around in Bethany. But Really, we're going to spend most of our time tonight talking about the first part of this story, the bad news, if you will, the harder part of the story than the resurrection of Lazarus. That's the encouraging part and the part that makes everybody, you know, wow, this is uh, a wonderful story. And of course, without the resurrection of Lazarus, the story would be different. But uh, but I want us to think about before Jesus raises Lazarus, what's going on in the heart of Mary and Martha and the heart of Jesus and what do we learn in these first few verses of John chapter 11. And I'd like to make the connection between um, the interaction that Jesus has with an unnamed person in this chapter uh, who comes to Jesus on behalf of Mary and, Mar Mary and Martha. And we're going to hear what he says or she says in just a moment. Uh, but this unnamed person comes and essentially prays on behalf of Lazarus and on behalf of Mary and Martha. Now, you might say, well, this person is just talking to Jesus, not praying. I mean, he's uh, Jesus is literally on the earth. Well, okay, fair enough. But if you look at Mark chapter 9, for an example, Jesus is, uh, well, Jesus' disciples are trying to cast out this unclean spirit from this child uh, that's being going through all sorts of, of problems. And the father is frustrated that the disciples are not able to cast it out. And Jesus comes back and he's, you know, um, saying, what's going on? And, and uh, the father looks at Jesus and says, if you can do anything, please help my son. And Jesus says, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. So Jesus says, hang on a second, let me remind you, there's nothing I can't do, um, so don't don't worry about that. I can do it. Uh, it's everything's possible if you believe. And the man says to Jesus, "Lord, I believe. Please help my unbelief." Jesus casts out this spirit, and the disciples come to Jesus at the end of Mark nine, and they want to know why they were unable to cast this demon out. And Jesus says, "This kind can only be cast out through." prayer. This man coming to Jesus and saying, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. That's what needed to happen. That man needed to have a, a change of heart for this scene to unfold in Mark 9. So yes, that man was talking to Jesus, but in a, another way, he was praying. He was talking to God the Son and saying, please help me in this. And in the same way, in this passage, in John chapter 11, we're going to see how uh, an encounter between Jesus, the Son of God, and this unnamed person on behalf of this family that Jesus loves teaches us some things about prayer. So let's do that. Let's look at John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Now, I want to start just by saying, already from verse 1, we learn the need for prayer. Uh, Lazarus was ill, and there was no uh, possible cure that they could find in that moment to save him. There was He was just moments away from death. Uh, they sent to Jesus out of desperation because they didn't know where else to turn. The reality is that the need for prayer, despite advancements that have been made in just about every area of life in terms of technology and medicine and um, efficiency and all of the transportation, all these things that take place, the reality is the need for prayer, the need for reliance upon God is as great today as it's ever been. Um, Paul and Peter both have similar statements, expressions of saying, the Lord has given us life, breath, and everything else. Uh, everything that we have comes from him, and we depend on him every single day. 
But in our world, there are certain moments, certain times in life where we realize just how dependent upon God we are, how much is outside of our control, how much we can't just will our way through, and we have to go to God in prayer. And so the need for prayer is not really anything that um, that I need to tell you about because we all know of situations in our lives and in the lives of those that we love where there's just been no resort other than prayer. Now, let me say carefully, prayer should not be a last resort, but when we do have those situations where it is the only resort, it just solidifies to us how important it is for us to have a life dependent upon God and how important it is for us to pray. So there's the need for prayer. But then I want you to think about, and I was reading in a book the other day, this author brought this out. I thought this was a really good point. Um, if you read here, Mary and Martha in verse 3 sent to him saying, they sent Jesus a message. They sent a messenger to Jesus. They sent somebody, someone to go to Jesus and bring this petition, bring this plea. This unnamed person, he or she, I don't know, uh, comes to Jesus and makes a request saying, Lord, the one whom you love is ill, is sick. And the author that I was reading was just bringing out the fact that um, there are people that are praying that from the perspective of the world, from, from the perspective of even the person being prayed about that has no idea, it's just somebody praying. But to God, uh, this is a person uh, whose petition is heard and who matters and who's doing an important thing. And the scriptures are filled with a discussion, not just of the need and importance of prayer, but the importance of the prayer, that, that uh, it's not just what is said that matters, but it matters that we pray. Uh, people always ask the question, doesn't God know everything that I need? Why do I need to ask for it? Uh, you know, why do I need to come to him and, and talk to him? And there's many things that we could say in response to that. But one of the things that we must say in response to that is that prayer is not primarily about what it does to God. It's about what it does to us, right? The change that is made within us, that it's important for us to pray for our spiritual formation, for us to hear our dependence upon God coming out of our lips for us to learn our reliance upon him through prayer. And, and again, there's a lot of other facets, other angles that we could look at, absolutely. Uh, but, but prayer matters not just because it's something that we're bringing to God, but the act of doing that uh, changes who we are. It's part of God's sanctifying work in our life. Mary and Martha, in sending to Jesus, are admitting publicly we need you, Lord. We need help here. And our prayers function in very much the same way. So the need for prayer, we have all kinds of needs for prayer. And then the importance of the prayer, the importance of the person, whether you're a named character or an unnamed character, right? Whether it seems like you're important or insignificant, the fact of the matter is we're all made in the image of God, but I know human nature well enough to say that some of us feel a little uh, like we're too important in the story and others of us, uh, and I think this category is more full than the other, uh, others of us feel like we're too insignificant in the story than we really are. And so um, whether you feel like a somebody or a nobody, the reality is that this passage teaches us, hey, Jesus is listening to this nobody's prayer, this no-named character's prayer on behalf of Mary and Martha. And isn't it an encouraging thing? I just think about uh, at our church, we have people that are ill from time to time, of course, and, and with COVID, that's certainly been a factor. But all the time, there's somebody that's got some challenge that they're facing. And it's true, we pray for these people publicly often. But it's also true that I know many of you are praying for one another on a regular basis. And the fact is, many people that are being prayed about at our church have no idea. From their perspective, they just don't know that it's happening. Uh, they know maybe that they're on the prayer list or that we're praying publicly for them. But I know many of you are praying regularly for uh, the needs of people in the church. 
And to be honest, I, I can also say that I, I absolutely know that many of you are praying for me, praying for Sarah. And, and what an encouragement it is to know that even though we don't know the names of every single person praying for us or for someone that we love, but we know the prayers are being said. We know that God is being invited in again and again to the situation. And so that prayer, uh, prayer, I should say, is so important. The need for prayer and the importance of the prayer. Then we keep reading in this story, though, and what we see is the complexity of prayer. Because, listen, this story would make a lot more sense, or to us it would seem a lot clearer, if Jesus heard this person come and say, Lord, the one you love is ill, and he said, okay, gets up, goes down there, heals him, and moves on. But we know that's not exactly what happens, because if you look here in verse 4, um, when Jesus heard it, he said, heard that Lazarus was ill, he said, this illness does not lead to death, it's for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, and this does not make any sense, he stayed two days longer in the same place where he was. Did you hear that? Because he loved them, he stayed two days longer. It doesn't make sense from our perspective. Uh, then after this, verse 7, then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going to go there again. And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he'll recover, he'll wake up. Now, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. And then Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. So they, they pretty much resigned. This guy cannot be helped. He's going back to where they're trying to kill him. Um, he's speaking of somebody falling asleep. Oh, he's actually dead and he's going to try to go do something, you know, special. But they are very much out of the loop. But nevertheless, Thomas says, eh, if, he, if he's going to go get himself killed, we might as well go too. So I don't know if that's an encouragement or not, but, uh, but there it is. So this is an interesting story, though, because here Jesus is received this request and Lazarus is sick, but Jesus waits until Lazarus dies before he goes up there. And it's a matter of days before he is there to uh, talk to Mary and Martha and to raise Lazarus from the dead. And to me, this story has always been a way of illustrating the complexity of our prayers, that there's a lot going on behind the scenes that we just do not understand. Um, Jesus is saying, hey, this worked out this way, and I've got a plan, I've got a purpose here in the midst of all of this mess, in the midst of all this grief, something is going to happen that's going to be a blessing, and in this case, a blessing to Lazarus, to Mary and Martha, to the disciples, to the crowd around, and everything else. Uh, but as, as Christians, we believe through the scriptures, the teaching of the scriptures, that God is at work in the world, but certainly we are humble enough, uh, and I pray that this is true, that we're humble enough to admit we don't know the half of how God is working in the world. In fact, we don't even know like 0.00001% of how God is working in the world. Um, we know what God has revealed to us in scripture. We know God's motives. We know um, some examples of how God has worked in the past. Uh, but ultimately, we're like in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 8, we're like the Hebrews writer who says, um, we don't really understand. We don't see everything in his control, but we see him. So we don't understand how God is at work, but we know that he is working in the world. And this is a good story in my mind to illustrate to myself that when I come to God with a prayer, I come to Jesus with my concerns, I have a very actionable um, response that I think God should make. And he doesn't always do that. And it's a reminder that God is sitting at a different vantage point than I am. And because of that, God chooses to make different decisions than I would, uh, or that, that I am trying to uh, kind of force God into making through my prayers sometimes. That God's wisdom, his love, his, his power, all of those 
uh, attributes of God come together where God makes the best decision, even if I can't comprehend it, even if I don't understand it. That's really the message of Job, right, is that uh, even in the midst of all that Job went through, God's response to Job was not, let me give you a 30-page essay on why these things happened. It's, let me give you a reminder of who I am. I want you to re be reminded that you can trust me because of who I am, not just because I provide you with um, the reasons for every decision that I choose to make. And of course, we're reminded of Isaiah telling us his ways are higher than our ways, and all of those other things come to mind as well. But nevertheless, Jesus in this story does something that we don't expect in waiting, and it ends up being a great blessing in the end. And Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, hey, God's working all things together for good for those that love him. And, and the point there is not God causes everything to happen, but the point is, in the midst of everything that happens by nature of uh, the natural causes, by nature of uh, people's sinful choices, by nature of people's righteous and good choices, all these things that go on in the world, God is there working it out for good for those that love him. I love a quote uh, that, that Tim Keller uh, has said on, on, I think, many occasions, but one of the things that he has said about prayer is he said, um, basically, when it comes down to God's wisdom, and I'll, I'll read it here so that I, I don't butcher it, but he says, uh, if we knew what God knows, then we would ask for exactly what God gives. If we knew what God knows about our situation when we bring a request to God, if we were sitting at the same vantage point as he did, and maybe we could add if we had the character God has, because maybe we would use that position to uh, treat ourselves rather than, um, rather than doing what is best for all. But nevertheless, if we knew what God knew about our situation, then we'd answer the prayer the same way God answers, that God answers every prayer in the best way possible, even when it does not feel like it, even the, when it does not seem like it. And that's why the psalmists are always coming to God and saying, here's what I want, God. Here's, here's the concern. Here's the trouble. Here's the heartache. And they're pouring out their soul before God. And then they're telling themselves, wait on the Lord. Be patient. Hope in the Lord. Um, why is my soul downcast? I'll hope in the Lord. Put my hope in the Lord. Um, they're, they're always going back to these refrains of hoping in the Lord and waiting on the Lord, that they trust that God is doing the right thing, even if they struggle to understand why things are working out the way that they are. And that leads us to the last observation I'd like to make about this passage, which is, okay, so if we've talked about the complexity of prayer, now let's talk about the reason there is hope in prayer. Let's talk about really the reason for prayer in the sense that um, why, why should we pray, knowing that it's complicated, knowing that life is filled with challenges, uh, why should we pray? Why do we have confidence in prayer? Why do we have hope in prayer? And the answer is found in two verses here. Um, first, we've already read it, but I'll read it to you again. First, it comes in the very petition that is made in verse 3. Lord, he whom you love is ill. And then in verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When the sisters send this petition to Jesus, they're sure to emphasize they know Jesus loves their brother. They know Jesus loves their brother. And when things don't work out the way that they think they ought to, Martha and Jesus are going to have a conversation where Martha's going to say, if you would have been here, this wouldn't have happened. You know, what, what went on? And Jesus is going to work through that with her and with Mary. And, you know, he's going to weep and, uh, and, and just all that goes on in the story. It's wonderful how Jesus works through the grieving process with the two sisters, helps them to come through it, how he expresses his humanity. You know, we get the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. And, and it's the shortest, but what a meaningful verse it is for us to see the humanity of Jesus. Nevertheless, we think about the complexity of prayer well, here we have the reason for praying. We pray because we know that God loves whomever it is that we're praying about. Whether it's our us individually, whether it's people that we love, people that we know, people that we are, are close to, they're going through something serious, whether it be um, the people of our country or the globe or another country or whatever the case might be, we come to God in prayer, not because we know exactly how God is going to answer the prayer, 
but we know exactly what God's attitude is toward the people that we're praying about. We know that God loves them 1,000%. That there's not a single person that we could come to Jesus and pray about and say, the one whom you kind of like, the one whom you don't love, uh, every single person that we bring to God in prayer, we come and we say, the one whom you love is ill, is suffering, is um, in, a, in a precarious situation, in a bad relationship, picking up the pieces from a divorce, whatever the case is. Every person we come to and we pray about, we're able to pray because we know God loves them. And we actually know God loves them more than we do. And God loves Nathan Diller more than Nathan Diller does. God loves you more than you do. And if we have that level of conviction, if we have that confidence, that's how we have confidence in prayer, is to know that Jesus loves each of us and every person that we pray about. In the midst of the complexity, when things get hard for us to comprehend, we go, how is, how is this going on? We reassure ourselves, we remind ourselves through the scriptures, there's nobody that loves people me and others. There's nobody that loves people more than God. And there's nobody wiser than God or more powerful than God. And so whatever is happening, there is a, a certainty, an absolute certainty that God will work it together for the good of those who love him. That there's no question about the ultimate outcome. I'm not talking about the short-term outcome. I'm not talking about um, that job that you lost is automatically going to come back. Certainly not suggesting that we're going to have Lazarus experience in our lives where we're going to be praying for someone that's died and they're going to come back uh, to life. What I am suggesting is that in the end, when all is said and done, we will be able to look back on our lives and we'll be able to see how God has been sowing a cord through our lives, leading us um, to our ultimate joy, leading us to our ultimate destination of life eternally with him. And he sustains us and supports us along the way. And so we look at John chapter 11, and it's a beautiful story as it unfolds, but we look at this moment of confusion. And, and uh, really, if you read it for the first time, you think, what is Jesus doing here? And we're reminded that we do the same thing in prayer. And that's okay. It's okay for us to wonder. It's okay to ask why things are happening. But at the end of the day, John chapter 11 points us back to the character of Jesus and reminds us that the reason we pray, it's not because we know the right thing to do. It's not because we have um, uh, this perspective where we say, God's going to do what I say that he should do. We come to, pr come to God in prayer because we know that he will act and that he does love the person that we're praying about more than we could ever imagine. And so in the meantime, in the midst of the confusion, in the midst of the fog, we wait on the Lord in trust and hope, in his goodness, in his greatness, and ultimately we look back to the cross and say, he's given everything for us. I can certainly continue trusting him, even in the midst of this moment of despair, even in the midst of this difficult grief or circumstance or situation. I'll continue to put my hope in him, as the psalmists say because the Lord is a rock and a refuge. Uh, all who uh, flee to him for, for refuge find that security, find that uh, constant source of sustaining power. And so tonight, I just want to encourage you to bring your concerns to God in prayer. I want to encourage us to, to come to God with all the, the burdens that we carry and say, Lord, I, I, we don't actually know what the outcome should be. We, here's what we think it ought to be, but we don't really know what it should be. But we have absolute, unconditional trust in your love for us. And as a, an, by extension, uh, we have absolute, unconditional trust in how you're going to handle the situations of our lives today tomorrow, and forever, for all eternity, will be in God's hands. And that should be, for us, a great joy, a great comfort as we go through life's challenges. Would you pray with me as we close today? Father, thank you for the unimaginable blessing and privilege of prayer that we're able to approach your throne with confidence and boldness through the grace and mercy and sacrifice of Jesus. Father, we come boldly to bring our requests, our burdens to you, to 
share with you about those that we love that are ill and those that we love that are going through really hard times or relational challenges and spiritual uh, low points and um, emotional stresses and so many other things that people are carrying, Lord. Father, we just pray that you would be with them and we have certain outcomes that we would love to see happen in all of their lives. But Father, ultimately, we just pray that you would remind us that you love them more than we love them and that you will work all things together for their good and for our good, uh, that you're in the ultimate joy business and we're uh, unable to have the, the vantage point as finite humans to be able to determine what will give someone that ultimate joy in the end. And Father, we pray that you would help us to be patient in suffering and in hardships when they befall us, and that we would learn to wait on you each and every day of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.